Well, it's my pleasure on this uh, um, winter session, uh, Abrahamic Faith Forum for 2024, to introduce you to our two speakers. Uh, Dr. Darren Thomas is a member of the Seneca Nation and his bear clan resides on the Grand River Territory of the Haudenosaunee. Darren is an associate professor in the Indigenous Studies Program and in July 2021 accepted an appointment as the Associate Vice President of Indig Indigenous Init Initiatives at Laurier. He manages a team of staff that has the responsibility to support Indigenous students, staff, and faculty to reach their highest potential while developing a strategic vision and implementation for indigenization, decolonization, and reconciliation. Darren's personal interests are Indigenous thought and philosophy, Indigenous community development, strengthening and improving Indigenous health and well being, Indigenous law and Indigenous rights and resource governance. Darren is no stranger to Luther. He has served as a resource person for our faculty retreats. I know that he's spoken many times in my class, others as well, I imagine. Certainly in my class, the students give him rave reviews. They love Darren and I love <laughs> having him there. I recall, recall clearly the first time I heard him speak in the Paul Martin Center when he was still a doctoral student, I think, on the topic of education as a resource for decolonizing and indigenizing. His career has been fascinating and Laurier is extremely fortunate to have him in this position and we are so very glad he's with us today. The Reverend Dr. Christine Lund is Principal Dean at Luther. She received her PhD in secondary education from the University of Alberta on the topic of the pastoral counseling students experience of learning to be present with their clients. She completed her Master of Divinity degree at Lutheran Theological Seminary in Saskatoon and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from the University of Calgary. Prior to coming to Martin Luther University Co College, Chris was the program coordinator for the Master of Arts in Pastoral Psychology and Psychotherapy at St. Stephen's College in Edmonton, where she also had a private psychotherapy practice and supervised pastoral counseling students. Chris is an ordained Lutheran pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada and is also a registered psychotherapist with the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario and is certified as a specialist and a teaching supervisor in pastoral counseling education with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. Chris came to Luther then Waterloo Lutheran Seminary one month before I did and I have had the privilege to know her as a colleague. She's the recipient of the Society for Pastoral Counseling Award and the Eastern Synod Leadership Award, which is especially fitting since it was her vision that gave birth to the Delton Glebe Counseling Center, which has grown exponentially in service to Luther Laurier and the broader KW community. Welcome to both of you. Darren, the floor is now yours. Thank you all very much. It's my honor and pleasure um, privilege to be able to come and visit with you once again. Um, I think, you know, I, I went back and forth. Do I prepare slides or not? Or, you know, what do I do in terms of a formal presentation? And, you know, I, I'm just going to, you know, just try to encourage us. To, let's just embrace a Indigenous pedagogy and let's just tell some stories and, and do a little bit of visiting. Um so uh thanks alan for for the introduction and and you know I, I uh daniel approached me several months ago to come by for this visit and always enjoy our conversations and supporting the work over at luther um and, and i think you know when i think back about my work and my career and you know i'm i'm often you know, I'm of an age, I'm I'm in a weird position within my existence and time. And and what I mean by I, I was raised uh four generations removed from Indian residential school. So I was raised in the culture, I was raised going to ceremonies, um, and I was raised really intact with knowing my identity. Um and for a person of my age, that's that's really rare because folks that are just a couple years older than me 
actually still went to Indian residential school. Um, but for me, because I was raised in this foundation, I was raised with a really sound understanding of Neha, which means uh, our ways, our original ways. And I think when, you know, someone looks at my CV, they're quite amazed because I've done everything. <laughs> uh, I worked in all levels of education. Uh, and believe me, my toughest day teaching was kindergarten. I did a supply teach for kindergarten and I was exhausted at the end of that day. Of course, way back then, we didn't have EAs and all the supports you have now. And I think in my morning class, I had 28 uh, children. And in my afternoon class, I had 35. So I was exhausted. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but I've done everything. I've worked in radio. I've worked in theater. Um, I've worked in addictions. Uh, and I, I ran a forum theater group that traveled all across Canada uh, I became a, a professional entertainer myself, so I actually do comedy stage hypnosis. I don't know if I told the folks at Luther that I do that or not, but um, so my my life and career in, in academia actually started quite late, um, and really, um, my life at Laurier, uh, all my degrees are from Laurier, um, but I, I didn't start out from high school going to Laurier. In fact, uh, a lot of the challenges in my academic career um, started really um, when I was going to uh, talk to my grandmother about going to university. Because I was really excited as a young man and wanting to go to school and, and wanting to learn how to help folks. And, and I actually got into a program at Laurentian that at the time was called a Native Social Work Program. And, uh, and she told me not to go. She <laughs> said, they're going to change you. They're going to uh, change your mind, you know, because... In our teachings, we talk about these mind changers, right? And we look at drugs and alcohol and these things as, as mind changers. They they derail you from who you're supposed to be. And she was of the age still, you know, because, you know, she had witnessed the harm coming from Indian residential school. And so that was still in her mind that that was going to cause me to be upset. And my first year of university, you know, I was quite successful um, in there. Um, however, uh, being raised here in the South, I could not stand the North. And, and Sudbury is not even that North, but tell you, 40 below is 40 below, right? So I could not handle it. Um, so I moved uh, South and transferred schools and went to Western. And, and I'm sorry if we have any Western alum on, on the call today, but Western treated me awful in the late 1980s, right? And they, um, you know, I had one of my professors actually say to me that I had to stop thinking like an Indian. And, um, of course, knowing who I am and, you know, my resolve, I said, well, that's never going to happen. So I guess this means nothing to me so I quit school and I had to go back home and I had to tell my grandmother that this had happened to me and that she was right that they were trying to force me to change how I think and the way I think and so from that moment I really dedicated my life to learning what my roles duties and responsibilities were as a as a as a real person and understanding my duties to community and so I started uh, doing a lot of uh, different work for my community I helped set up the radio station and I was volunteering um, at an addiction center and then I ended up getting a job there and was working there for a number of years 
And what ended up happening was I really spent a lot of time really understanding our teachings and our culture and, and the values and principles of both in the language we would say the great and everlasting love right and this is otherwise known as being called the great law of peace uh, that came to our people and it's really the founding formation of the Haudenosaunee confederacy that really binds our entire way of life right and it's premised on this principle of ganakuyo this good mindedness and it, it is a, a bit of how to balance your reason and your passion and how to be a good human being, right? But it's, again, it's, we could go days and days and days to really try to help you understand this, but it's really, it, it's the pathway to being a good human being, right? And there's central principles that are wrapped around this. I will help that kind, gentle, uplifting words. Uh, gasashra, that you need to have strength. Um, Gendao, you need to have compassion, right? And Ganokwashra, you know, you need to have love. And, you know, like these, these don't directly translate into English, right? And, you know, and, and I'm paraphrasing huge concepts. So, you know, when when we talk about our health, it's not just kind, gentle words, but it, it's a whole principled way of life. So in our language, when we give greetings, when we say scano, we're actually asking, is a great peace with you? Right. And, and that's a real question when we ask that. So if you and I met Alan on campus one day and I said, you know, scan out to you and and you would say oh darren i'm not well i want how that obligates me to sit with you until you're in a better place because it's a principle that we should always part company better than when we met right so you imagine a society that focus on each other's well-being so much so that whenever we met each other we ensured that we were both better in our place, in our frame, in our mind. Um, so it's about always lifting one another. This this kind, gentle, uplifting words, these encouraging words are what we're always supposed to use. So even if we have to correct our children, we're supposed to do it with love. I think some people might know this as guilt, right? I'm, I really love you, so you shouldn't smoke, right? Because I care for you so much, right? <laughs> But it's this kind of thing, this concept to always use it. And rather than restricting and using harsh words, it's always about lifting one another. So this is the way that, that I come to learn and understand what it meant to, to be a good human being. And so I, I started working in, in the high schools uh, locally. And... I think when I start working there, that's what really opened my eye to, because uh, I worked in uh, six different school sites and met several uh, kids from Six Nations there, because at the time, we didn't have our own high school. We sent them off the reserve. And so uh, being in a support position for these students while they transitioned into high school and trying to keep them in school, I really began to identify, you know, and, and this is a time when we never talked about colonialism, right? In the 90s, this wasn't a buzzword as it is today, um, you know, and so we were really becoming more conscious of trauma and intergenerational trauma and historic trauma. And these things were starting to emerge in health and healing circles. And that's where I, I start, because I was witnessing such a diverse set of families in, in young people coming to the schools. And I, I began to identify those families, those students that were being successful, were really the ones that had their identity intact. 
you know, the ones where they still had a, a legacy of trauma in their family from Indian residential school and violence. And, you know, that brought on the addiction and all the other complications that come with poor health and well-being and poverty. And so, you know, before we were even conscious and talking and writing about colonialism and trauma, um, I was with, witness to this while I was working in the schools. And, you know, like I, I love doing that job, but it was a very frustrating job because it was trying to work within this huge school board. And I was doing this in the 90s. And if anybody's been around education in Ontario and you, you remember what happened in the 90s, uh, the Harris government did this massive amalgamation of all these school boards. So I used to work in former Haldeman School Board, which was amalgamated to become Grand Erie. And we were amalgamated with Norfolk and uh, Brant School Board, right, to become the largest geographic board in Ontario. Stretches all the way from Dunville, if you're familiar with Southern Ontario, to all the way to you know, way out um, on the lake to the city of Brantford, right? And basically, when we were working with Haldeman, when I say we, Six Nations, community of Six Nations, we had a really strong relationship and partnership in education. They understood that we need to work together to ensure the success of our Indigenous students going to school there. And when we amalgamated, it was such a massive board. The, the leadership of the board could care less about our students. And um, I used to uh, tease my sister because my sister's a lawyer and uh, she was on sister retainer. <laughs> so anytime I needed a letter, uh, because we always had to threaten charter challenge because of the discrimination we were facing because they weren't acknowledging any of our rights or any of our requests to, to even have our rights respected about wanting to support Indigenous students. And when we were with Haldeman, we had some of the highest graduation rates in the country of Indigenous students. And all that got dissolved through amalgamation because the leadership could care less and had you know much other energy. So. So I left, I left the school board and I started my own consulting firm. And it was really based on what I come to know about how to be a good human being. Because what I began to realize is that this need for identity support was happening everywhere. Because that by this time we were very conscious of colonialism we were really writing and talking about it and understanding much more significantly the history and the trauma from this legacy of Indian residential schools and, and violence. So um, all my work that I did, and, and so what I, as a consultant, I was working with different school boards um, across the country. I was working with indigenous communities and doing everything, stay in school, prevention, health promotion, uh, suicide prevention, everything. But it was all based on traditional knowledge. And so I, as I would work with different communities, I would work with their knowledge holders and, and learn about their culture and, and help them design programs and initiatives that would bring more culture to their young people. And essentially, we were kind of you know, doing a lot of youth work in, in name only because we, we were securing a lot of, um, at the time there were a lot of funds for youth, but really it was family. It was family interventions that we were doing because, you know, the hardest part, and, and this was what I witnessed when I was working in a residential treatment facility, the hardest part about any treatment program is we're working with that one individual, but we have to send them back to their family, back to their community where they've been the only one who had an intervention and we have to deposit them back into that life of unhealthiness. 
So our success rates weren't really too high because unless you can have a kind of, you know, community and, and family intervention, you're not going to have much success. So I start really using a lot of that work and knowledge uh, to apply it. And my business really took off. As I said, you know, uh, I am not a fan of the the cold weather. So I start doing work with the Seminoles down in Florida and the, you know, folks in uh, Arizona, folks in California. So I was magically getting all these contracts for two, three, four weeks, you know, away. And it was probably the wrong time to start a family, right? Because my <laughs> said to me hey fella you help make these babies you gotta help raise them which was absolutely fair um so i started a part-time job uh working at laurier in 2006 um and because it was part-time i was still able to do my consulting on the side and allowed me to pick and choose my contracts and this was also at the same time, you know, so way before the TRC, we in in uh, 1996, we had the Royal Commission report, right? And, and the Royal Commission report sat on the shelf for 10 years before anybody really did anything with it. But what happened in the mid 2000s, um, the government of Canada start really trying to respond to some of those calls um, for change. And so as a consultant, rather than working with Indigenous community, a lot of my focus become working in the public sector. So I start working in healthcare, in justice, in child welfare, and all levels of education um, on how to better serve Indigenous families. And then this, when the TRC came around, this even more exploded into this work. Um, but at the same time, as I was working for Laurier part time, I got interested in um, and and by the way, you know, in there, I, I started working on my degree and got my undergraduate degree. But as a staff member, when I became a full time staff member, uh, you get free tuition. Uh, so I finished my master's degree and uh, I did my master's part time. And when I came to complete my master's, I was invited into the PhD program. And that's when I really started looking at, again, uh, my degrees in community psychology. And, and if folks aren't familiar with community psychology, I'm not surprised, right? It's, it's not a well-known discipline at all uh, in Canada. It's actually well-known internationally, but it, it in Canada, you see it a lot, uh, similar degree programs in like public health or public policy and things like that. But what community psychology does as a discipline is it tries to support and develop health and well-being of community, whether it's a geographic community or a community by population of people. So what's really unique as this discipline, when I came back to work at Laurier, I start meeting some of the professors in the community psychology program. And they were asking me about, about my community work. And they said, oh, wow, you're doing such perfect community psychology. Where'd you get your credentials? And I laughed and I said, from my ancestors. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, have you ever heard of community psychology, right? It's this great new innovative discipline it emerged in 1968, and it talks about interrelated well-being and community health and well-being. And they start throwing all these theory at me, and I start laughing at them. And I said, well, this isn't new. Indigenous people and collective societies have understood health and well-being in this way since the beginning of time. So I start saying to them all these concepts of how I was raised and what we need to support health and well-being. And they were just completely blown away by it. So it really allowed me the opportunity to bring myself into a modern Western discipline and to challenge the academy and some of our historic theories around 
what is health and well-being to look at it in a very different avenue and a very different lens. And when people learn about my dissertation, they they get really questioning what the heck I'm all about because I actually started working in mining. And they're saying like, well, why are you looking at mining? You're a psychologist. What do you care about mining? Well, again, remember, it's health and well-being. And in Canada, we know what's the backbone of the Canadian economy. It's natural resource extraction, right? And in, you know, 400 years ago, it was furs. And then once the fur trade exploded and indigenous people were seen in the way, they pushed all those communities to the north into remote areas of the country. But then in the 20th century, they discovered all the forestry. And, and again, folks, how much you know about forestry or not? Do you know Canada has the second largest forest in the world? The boreal forest goes across the entire part of the country where, you know, outside of the Amazon, the boreal forest is the second largest forest in, in the world. And so forestry exploded. And then around the mid 20th century, mining and mineral exploded. So indigenous people, again, are once in the way. So whether you're talking trees, minerals, pipelines, this is still causing significant disruption to community health and well-being. Because indigenous peoples have uh, six times higher the cancer rate than Canadians. And when they go into these northern and remote areas of the country, they don't bring out their toxic waste, right? They leave it there. And in fact, many mineral companies will say there is no better scientific way to clean that water than to seal a natural aquifer, dump all our toxic waste in there, and the natural hydrologic cycle will eventually clean that water perfectly in about 50,000 years, right? <laughs> but in the meantime, communities suffer. And again, what do we hear most about Indigenous communities in Canada? The lack of potable water, the lack of basic human dignity, of shelter, of education, of healthcare, all of these things. So this is again why when you look at the population health data of Indigenous people in Canada, we're at the top of every single one. Cancer rate, heart, to, heart disease, diabetes, everything, right? So the connection here then is what Indigenous communities have is they have a lot of power because they sit in these areas that are mineral rich. And these developers need access to that. And we're now standing in a time in Canada when inherent treaty rights are recognized by the government of Canada. And so Canada has to do their due diligence to ensure that communities are at least benefiting from this kind of development, right? So whether they get dividends, whether they get infrastructure, whether they get you know clean water, these are all negotiated acts uh, with these uh, uh, between uh, proponents and and indigenous community. So for me, it made perfect sense when we're trying to look at power and supporting communities in a manner of exercising their power and having the basic human right to say yes or no to these kind of projects because they're the ones that are going to experience the most impact and the most harm for these projects to move forward. So this is, again, why we witness continual civil disobedience in Canada. These are what communities are trying to face and protect. And so uh, my work was based in uh, Northern Ontario in, in what's known as a Matawa region, which is this massive chromite proposed development project in Northern Ontario. 
It's a hundred years of development sitting there worth $225 billion. And there's nine small First Nation communities that surround this. So, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to be talking about decolonizing here, but this is kind of, you know, leading into this conversation is understanding the role of co colonialism and understanding the power that colonialism has done to undermine Indigenous health and well-being. So in my work in across the public sector, it was really analyzing, you know, what is the nature of these services in the public institutions in Canada, the nature of child welfare, of justice, of health care, you know, of education, right? And who was it designed by? And who was it designed to serve? And who benefits the most from it? Right? And, you know, in terms of justice, we're all certainly, you know, can remember the murder of George Floyd, right? And and the civil disobedience that come out of that. And the cry for, you know, defunding the police and eliminating the police. And, and that created a lot of division amongst people and where the dividing line was, was if you felt that police served or if you felt police harmed, right? And it really depended on what was your lived experience. So me as a racialized indigenous person, I've been targeted, I've been beaten, I've been harassed. So police weren't in good service, in my opinion. But if you never had any kind of harmful experience with the police, you feel the police are good, they're just, they're fair, they serve, they protect, right? And it's all about perception and what is your lived experience of those things, right? And so as we start looking at, well, how do we improve policing? But we only talk to people who are not harmed by police. Then we're going to say, policing is fine. We don't need to adjust anything at all. Right? So as I work with public sector agencies, I said, well, who are you talking to when you're talking about improving your services? If you only pay attention to the voices of the people who these services actually work for, who benefit from, then you're going to see there's nothing wrong with what you do. But you need to speak to the ones who've been harmed, who experience marginalization, who experience violence, who experience oppression from these institutions. So... Since accepting this role, I regularly admit, and I'm sure probably senior leadership is tired of me saying this, I didn't want this job, right? And, you know, because I know the difficulties with this job in in education, because I had did it for 10 years with Haldeman, former Haldeman and Grand Erie. So trying to transform a system from within is a near impossibility because these systems are structured to support power and privilege, right? And without really being able to critique the system itself, we're unable to really see the harm that the system causes, right? So, you know, the flip side of this, you know, I finished my degree, I got hired as a professor in 2017, I was teaching, and, and I absolutely love teaching, right? And when I was invited to apply for this role, I, I really debated because I knew it would make teaching almost impossible because I'm so busy in this work. Um, but I also, um, I was pre-tenure when I applied for this job. And those of you familiar with the university, you know, tenure is a lot of power. 
And so I had negotiated my tenure review before uh, taking this job because I knew I was going to have to be in a position to be able to speak very candidly to the university. And there's no way I was going to do that pre-tenure because I wouldn't want to subject myself to tenure review after I upset everybody, right? So, um, but what I will say, you know, um, because my appointment is an academic appointment, because I do have tenure, it does give me power within the structure of the system to speak candidly. And I, I have a relationship with our president and, and my direct report, the provost, um, to really challenge them to lead Laurier as a treaty partner. Because like it or not, as a public university, we inherit the harms of colonialism. We didn't cause it, but we're part of it, right? Education and the dismantling and disenfranchising of Indigenous peoples from their land, from their resources, are all tied to what we teach at a university, right? What happens in, in the School of Business econ Economics, what happens in our science faculty and anthropology, don't get me started, you know, Anthropology as a discipline has caused a significant harm to humanity. Um, so when we're talking about now trying to shift what we do at a university, it means really having to look at who we are critically, looking at the history of the academy and the purpose of the academy. And are we still serving that same purpose? Remembering that the history of the academy at one point meant only men, only white Anglo men were allowed to learn, right? So shifting from that history to one where we're talking about trying to be diverse and inclusive. And, and the conversation I have about indigenous thought philosophy is that we really haven't had the full opportunity to make a contribution to knowledge yet because we were othered so much by those anthropologists that categorize us as subhuman, uncivilized, and primitive. Yet when you study our civilizations, we're as complex and profound as any civilization in the world. Even if you examine Canada, we had laws, we had justice, we had health care systems, education systems, social welfare systems, uh, economies, arts, music. Everything you imagine of a civilized state was here and was here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But because we didn't resemble anything what the settlers understood civilization to be, they categorized us as uncivilized. And that became the dominant narrative of Canada, right? We don't ever hear the stories about the complex civilizations here. This isn't taught in school anywhere because that narrative of primitiveness serves a purpose of saying it was okay to do what we did to Indigenous people, right? To learn of the profound civilizations means that maybe there's some problems here, you know? And that's a narrative that we do not talk much about. The fact that Canada has been one of the largest human rights violators in the world. The fact that they made it illegal for me to raise my own children, to practice my ceremony, to wear my clothes, to walk freely upon my land, right? That was the nature of the reserves that around us all up, right? 
So this is hard to unpack. So these are the things that we're unpacking when we're talking about decolonizing. And then when we talk about indigenizing, that's trying to create the space for indigenous thought and philosophy. In every single discipline, we can make a contribution to knowledge. Every single one. But we need the indigenous scholars, right? And so... Part of my job is also creating pathways for graduate students. We need more graduate students, right? I know at Laurier, we're lucky we have over 600 Indigenous students. Most of them are undergraduate students. And I tease them right out of the gate. You know, I said, you're staying here for more than one degree, right? You're doing master's, right? You ever thought about a PhD? You ever thought of becoming a professor, Right. And they don't, they don't think like that. They don't ever consider themselves that that's an opportunity. I said, you know, a life in academia is a good life. You know, especially at Laurier, we're paid well. We have a lot of benefits. We're, you know, have a lot of things to, to look forward to as a professor. And so a lot of our Indigenous students have barely gotten through high school are coming to university and thinking, I'm going to do my three or four years here and get the heck out. That's what I did when I did finally finish my, my undergrad, right? I never considered being, you know, a doctorate. But that that's the challenge we have, you know. So we're trying to implement a generational shift here with a lot of our Indigenous learners. And the big part of when we're trying to decolonize, you know, one of the things I've said is, is that it's impossible to decolonize the university. It's inherently colonial. It's impossible to indigenize it because it's inherently non-indigenous. But what we work for is making it as safe as possible, right? creating safer spaces. And so that means thinking critically about what we do, understanding that yes, harms do happen. And so we have to minimize and mitigate those harms and provide the necessary supports. So we have to think very critically, be conscious about what this space is and then making very intentional decisions to support health and well-being. And so those three framings are what I've really tried to do in all of my work, and that's what I brought here for, for Laurier in, in this commitment they have. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to end it there because I've been talking for a while and and give folks, I know, Christine, we're, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and maybe some questions back and forth and maybe others ask any questions. Um, but I want to um, invite anybody to ask anything. And, and I don't know if we've got a set agenda and how we're going to do this, Alan or, or Christine, but um, I just want to uh, take a pause and a break there for, for anything. Thank you, Darren. That's remarkable. You always leave me thinking so deeply. Um, we'll pass the baton over to Christine. And after Christine's done, if you have some questions, we'll allow you two to re respond back and forth with each other for a moment or two. And then if people have particular questions, again, to forward them to Debbie Lou. Thank you, Christine. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, well, Darren, first, I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's just, um, again, just a gift to have you in our midst. Um, and I'm thinking the next time it maybe should be the con comedy stage hypnosis. Maybe that's the next event we need to organize. That sounds like it would be a great community event. Um, as long as we lift each other up in it, right? <laughs> um, but I am so deeply grateful for your work at Laurier and the way that you have supported us at Luther to, to critically think about ourselves and to support my leadership. Because... Um, your work is so incredibly important. And as you talked about 
your own identity and growing up knowing who you were. I am, I just can give so much thanks to your family for the nurturing of that and your community for the nurturing of that in you. And it seems to me that those of us who are settlers in Canada, working in the realm of reflecting on the impact of colonialism, it's about identity for us too. And learning a more fulsome understanding of my identity. Because you're right, I, I went through school learning nothing about Indigenous history. Um, I mean, I lived close to Indigenous peoples, but never interacted with them in my childhood. They were separate. Um, I never, I was, I was denied that opportunity to, to have that learning. And so I think a lot of our learning as settlers is also recognizing our identity more fully as who we are as settlers. From the beginning land acknowledgement that we make to acknowledge that this land was given to, to us as an institution in 1911 by the Waterloo Board of Trade, but it wasn't their land to give us, right? Nobody told me of that until, I don't know, a few years ago, right? When I came in 2005, I mean, I heard the Waterloo Board of Trade gave us this land. Well, wasn't that nice? They were wanting to support, you know, post-secondary education in the region. Well, that was great, except the piece that it was Indigenous land was left off. Right. So my needing to grapple with that as a settler, what does that mean for me to live and work on land that was stolen? What does that really mean? And how do I engage in meaningful conversations with the Indigenous peoples in this community about that? And how does that impact the education that we do at Luther? Um, because you're right. I mean, we can't dismantle the colonial structure of the academy, I agree that that's, that's an impossibility. But I think there are things that we can do to address the structural systemic um, issues around power and privilege. And I think a lot of that comes from facing my own identity and what power and privilege I have inherent as being a white woman as being an educated person and all the various intersectionalities that I bring. And how do we as professors and students and staff and board at, at, at Luther grapple with the implications of those of that power and privilege? Um, I, I listened with interest when you talked about bringing the self into the modern discipline because that really resonates in many ways what we do at Luther. Um, I've had more than one student say to me, do you mean I can use the word I in my papers? And I go, absolutely. In fact, if you don't, it's going to be a problem. You need to be critically reflecting on who you are as you engage with the material we're studying with glass. So the I has to be in there as it interacts with the knowledge and, and how does that impact you and how will that impact the work that you're going to do? So that's a really important piece of the work that we do at Luther. Um, as well as also recognizing um, the voices that have not been present in our classes, because in our disciplines, in my discipline of psychotherapy or theology, it's been Western European and North American voices that are valued. They're the major voices. So, but there, it, it isn't that there aren't other voices. So how do we pay attention? How do we seek out those other voices? How do we include them in our classes as required readings? How do we bring in guest speakers who represent those communities and can invite and can invite us to reflect on our own identity differently as we as we engage with others? And that's been a very important part of the experience at Luther, particularly probably in the last decade that we've been working really hard with that whole piece around the intersectionality, the recognition of other voices, also the other ways of knowing through the arts, through 
through music, through art, through poetry, the place of the body in our in our intellectual enterprise. We're just not walking heads, right? We are embodied people. And how do we bring all of that into the scholarship we do too? So, so you know, we've been grappling with all of that. And I will I will admit it's not easy. It's not easy work. Um, sometimes I hear us being criticized for lack of rigor because it's not seen to be rigorous scholarship, but I would argue that it's incredibly rigorous scholarship. In fact, it might even be more rigorous scholarship than what's understood to be academic rigor. Um, and how we do that in community. I mean, you know that we've, we've in the last few years have made a requirement of our graduate students to do a, a course in indigenous wisdom and methodologies because we believe firmly that our students need to learn a fuller history of the indigenous people in Canada and also get an appreciation for the wisdom that is there uh, and to be able to recognize what Indigenous peoples have to offer and value that. And we also require a course in inter intersectionality to, again, look at the various ways in which we engage with others and others engage with us and the particularities that need to be paid attention to. And again, the role of power and privilege and all of that. And all of that's hard work. Um, it's hard work to face ourselves. But I also think it's incredibly important for us to do. And certainly I, as the principal dean at, Le at Luther, and I think the board and the staff and faculty have a strong commitment to continue this work and to find ways to figure it out because it doesn't always work out, right? And we, we can still do harm to each other. And then how do we address the harm? I love what you talked about in terms of always lifting one another up. Like, how do we do that? And when we harm each other, then how do we dress that harm so we can lift each other up? And how do we do that in community? And I think as Indigenous communities, you have so much to teach us about that. And I welcome those opportunities to learn and, and to, so that we can focus on each other's well-being. Um, we've benefited so much from, from developing related relationships with the Indigenous Student Center, which is just across the street from us. It's been, it's been, it's been amazing to have those relationships over the years and was something I really missed in the pandemic. You know, there went the soup lunches. We couldn't go and have soup and talk and meet students and the staff over there and, and uh, it 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 was a real um, uh, eye opener to me about how valuable those relationships have been, and and to Luther through through musical opportunities, through the art exhibitions of Indigenous artists, our life at Luther has been so enriched by our engagement and our learning, and our and our learning to value and what does that mean for me as a settler as I begin to recognize the indigenous people, as you say, who have been here for millennia and, and the contributions there are to make. So, so again, I, I really thank you for your comments tonight, Darren, and I thank you for your support as we at Luther continue to grapple with what does it mean to address power and privilege and um, and to work at that in community and to challenge ourselves to listen to the voices of others that aren't as well represented it, to invite them into our work and to be open to be changed. I think maybe that's perhaps the biggest work I as a settler um, need to be committed to is to be open to be changed, to, to recognize the need for my own vulnerability, to let myself be affected and impacted and learn and grow in that way. And then we will be able to be in a community where we can lift one up, one another up. So again, thank you so much, Darren. I really appreciate your support and your work with us at Luther. And again, look forward to a comedy stage hypnosis event.
Yeah, that would be my pleasure to be able to come and do that. If I could, just while I, before I forget, um, we are going to be restarting the lunches, but it's not going to be on a regular basis. Okay. And a series of lunch and learns. Great. And one we're starting with is uh, on the 23rd of February. It's Friday. Oh, great. Friday the 23rd. Uh, but we're going to be providing the lunch again part of part of the whole thing is um you know it probably was never the safest thing in all reality to have a massive potluck across the university <laughs> <laughs> thankfully nobody ever got sick i was gonna say i don't think heads. anybody ever got sick right you know but you know so we do have health and safety now we've got a, a inspected kitchen and we've got right. safe food, food handling so um it, it's we're gonna have you know some soup available but folks are going to be invited to bring their own lunch to sit and and the first talk is actually going to be featuring me oh. so if you want to learn some more things and so we're going to be talking about some of the where we are with our indigenization plan and what we're trying to do and some of our efforts for because i i know a lot of folks in leadership positions have seen a lot of those presentations that we've talked about but you know as we're trying to mobilize the actual you know quick wins and some of the low-hanging fruit around the campus mm -hmm. Um, we're going to be talking about some of those things and and trying to build the partnerships across the university for for how folks can help uh, do this good work. That's great. Yeah, I look forward to it. There will be publicity coming out, Darren. Yes. Or... Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll make sure that it gets shared. Okay. Awesome. Uh, good news, Darren, and thank you, Christine, for uh, responding. Um, I'm wondering, Debbie, Lou, do we have some questions for our speakers? We do. We have a couple of questions here. Um, this one for you, Darren. Um, a person deeply impacted by the Scano greeting and wondering how this might be a model to help us work at decolonial work and uh, reconciliation. That whole Scano, how it, you know, on the campus. What would that look yeah. like? So uh, again, understanding uh, the language and the greetings, you know, like, so if, uh, if you were doing a more informal one, you could just say Sago, right? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. like, basically, hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. um, but Scano, again, that opens us up to such a beautiful understanding about how to support health and well-being, you know, and really... You know, the these ways of knowing are really about sound principles uh, of the society that that we had constructed, and you know, a lot of the recorded Western history of Haudenosaunee people isn't that kind, right? As they talk about how warlike we were and how uh, evil we were and things like that, and we were mean, you know, but we weren't always mean, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm Seneca as I introduce myself and, um, uh, I tease a lot of Mohawk nation people cause we were the two most warlike nations and we were the ones always causing fight amongst mm. the foot, the Sony people. Mm. And, um, uh, I was just being teased by a Mohawk person the other day and she said, well, you Senecas, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't wait to ask anything about anybody. You'd beat them up first and then you'd ask, well, what do you want? Whereas mm -hmm. the Mohawks would ask, what do you want? And then we would beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this person was suggesting that maybe this, uh, uh, underlying idea of staying with someone until well they're not well right staying with them until they're yeah. okay yeah what does that look like on campus too right yeah well this is again um this also means that time has no relevancy right 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 because you sit with that person until it's necessary right mm -hmm. so uh if you have 
a class to go to, it doesn't matter. You got a meeting to go to, it doesn't matter, right? So your obligation is to that human being you're in front mm. of, right? And, and that, again, completely deconstructs what we know and understand about Western society. Sure does. Thank you. There's another one. Um, what are some things we can be doing to make colonial academic spaces more safe for Indigenous learners? What would you say? Well, you know, you would think this would be easy, but mm -hmm. it's not. And and I think I have a lot of, you know, a lot of discussions I have with uh, faculty members are you know, they're very passionate about their teaching and what they want to share and what they want to learn or, 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 or ensure the students are learning. But we get, we get stuck in what we know and what we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so for a brief period, I, I spent a year when I was a doctoral student, um, rather than TAing as the Aboriginal scholar in residence in the Faculty of Arts. And there were a lot of great faculty doing a lot of good things, but a lot of their resources were really dated and weren't coming from a very critical Indigenous lens. Mm -hmm. And so there's an explosion of Indigenous scholarship since about 99 that's really come into the academy to really push us to understand Indigenous thought and philosophy. Indigenous research methodologies, like Christine uh, mentioned, you know, and why this is really essential, because the, you know, if I'm going to try to be careful, not slip into a philosophical realm here, but it's, it's sometimes it's hard when we talk about uh, this. And, and again, from my own lived experience of doing my master's work, is again, when you're going into those philosophical places you know the nature of the academy what are we doing right we're we're building and supporting what is knowledge truth and mm -hmm. reality and because of the nature of the academy and the history of the academy that's always been dictated by western thought so they've always created the gold standard of what knowledge, truth, and reality is. And it had to look a certain way, which is the whole premise of objectivity, right? That you had to be removed from your ability. And again, this is why I pick on anthropologists, because as a discipline, Think of this as a discipline. They went all over the planet to study the cultures of humanity, but they did it purely as outsiders. Mm -hmm. And they became the experts on those cultures. And they did so by not talking to the people who were of that culture, mm -hmm. because they said, you're too close to your culture. You don't understand what your culture is. We need to have objective reality to understand what you're doing in your culture right? Which is ridiculous, right? <laughs> that we had a bunch of white men going all over the world, studying humanity, and then becoming experts in all of these various cultures around the world. And they did it everywhere, right? And so by challenging an introduction of Indigenous thought and philosophy, which is entirely subjective, mm. This is where the challenge is, because for me to understand who I am and the nature of my reality, I have to understand where I fit in this universe. And it's everything. What is my relationship to the trees, to the water, the sun, the moon, the stars? Everything to each other, to all life in this universe. That is the purest form of understanding the nature of knowledge, truth, and reality as an indigenous way of knowing. So in the challenge is in bringing indigenous thought and philosophy into the academy, we can see it's in direct opposition of some of our disciplines. So it mm -hmm. means a whole paradigm shift about what is the nature of reality. 
-hmm. right? And this is where it's conflicted so much, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we not see an explosion of students in the sciences? Because science is really trapped mm -hmm. in that objective way of thinking. But all we need to look at is read some of Vine Deloria Jr.'s work, mm -hmm. right? Because in his work, he pushes us way to understand indigenous science that we knew and understood. We had an empirical process to understanding the nature of truth and reality. It, it was not necessarily entirely the same way as the Western empirical process. But think about this. How did we, as Indigenous peoples, know what plants to use for our medicines, hmm. right? And this is what Vine talks about. He talks about, we observed, mm -hmm. we tested, we experiments, we watch where those plants grew, when they flowered, when they dropped their seed, what animals used them. That's how we come to know, right? So it's a whole empirical process we were doing, mm -hmm. but there's a spiritual sense to it. Mm. I think that's the additional challenge that many academics have is they can't appreciate how we come to know and what to understand in our world. Thank you. We can ask a couple more, Alan. Are we still good? Yeah, I think one or two yeah. more then probably okay. should. Okay, this one builds on that one then. So what would a classroom that engages in decolonial praxis look like? The thing is, colonization is still at work, may not be operating at the in the old methods, but it's still happening. So the question is, is decolonization a dream or a possibility? Um, this is not to say we should stop trying, but it's exhausting. So is decolonization a dream or a possibility? It has to be a vision that we work for, yeah. right? It has to be. Um, and, and you know, some of the challenges I face both uh, as a professor and in this role um, has been really pushing us as a university to look at, you know, some of these very substantive questions about what is the nature of what we do at a university, mm. right? Because if, if we think about the history of the academy, it was about really trying to create an informed citizenship of scholars and knowledge holders that were going to better society. Mm -hmm. And has that changed? Has that mission changed for us? right? And it really hasn't. However, for much of these same things that I've, I've been saying, that we get stuck in what we know, right? And so the challenges in some of these areas is we get trapped in the canons. We mm -hmm. always teach this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're always teaching the canons, who are the canons? Well, it's these white Anglo guys, right? So when I was teaching in, in Brantford and, you know, I, I, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a disturber, right? I like to <laughs> unpack and challenge some of this stuff. And, and those of you who may be not familiar with the Brantford campus, um, the Brantford campus used to have a, a required program called the foundations courses. And on paper, the foundation courses looked great because it was about learning how to be a better student, how to be a better writer, how to be a better academic, training you and, and talking about the, the nature and history of research and the academy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. However, the folks that taught those courses, that designed those courses were trapped in the canons. And mm -hmm. I would challenge students and, and, and the, why I got so annoyed at these folks and these courses, because I had to do all the repair work. I had to do all the report, repair work of the Indigenous students and racialized students and those who identified as, as you know, uh, LGBTQ or, or female, because what the canons do, again, they other any other way of knowing. 
Mm -hmm. right? And so for folks taking these courses, they weren't seen, they weren't represented, and in fact, they were entirely dismissed. Mm -hmm. So when you go and look at their syllabi, where were the racialized scholars? Where were queer scholars? Where were female scholars? They weren't present there. And so the underlying question is, does that mean we have no philosophers, right? Well, of course not, right? <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. We have deeply profound philosophical thinkers. Those of you who have never read John Mohawk, John Mohawk is an incredible scholar, profound, way beyond his time in understanding where indigenous thought philosophy can make contributions to humanity. Um, and, and so things like that is, is where and how we shift here. Mm. It, it's about challenging the canons to create space. And, and that's the problem, right? Is, is everyone has their passion and who they love to teach about, but we also need to evolve, this is what decolonizing is, right? Evolving to the nature of the academy. If the academy is about creating the best and well-known uh, nature of reality, then that means to be inclusive of other ways of knowing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing is that that means that, well, maybe one of those canons gets set aside and we introduce something else, right? Because mm -hmm. if we don't, we just perpetrate the harm mm -hmm. that is the deeply rooted colonialism that's evident in the academy. Thank you. Maybe the final question can uh, turn turn us a little bit to uh, where do you see signs of hope in your work? Do you see signs of hope in your work anywhere? Um... Well, at Laurier, we're really lucky. Because we're a smaller university, um, and, and one of the things, so whenever you're looking at systemic change, you have to look at uh, where power lies. Mm -hmm. So if we look at what we've done here at Laurier and, and, and previous to, to me being in this role, and I know folks, uh, she was mentioned tonight, Jean Becker was in a similar role previously, uh, but she didn't have the same level of structural power within the university. Her title was called senior advisor. Uh, when, when the position was first created, it was senior advisor to the president. And after the president realized that no other university had a position like that in, in their office, she fell down on the list, right? So suddenly she was re reporting to a vice president, you know, and she got shoveled underneath student affairs, right? And things like that. And uh, mm. so you need to have structural power, right? Within any kind of systemic change. And so as a senior advisor, you can offer all the advice you want. No one has to listen, right? right? So now when the, this role was shifted and changed to become a, 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 a associate vice president, hmm. um, it means I have power within the provost's office. And, and there was a lot of debate before this role was started. Um, that I've come to understand there was debate. Do we make it a vice president role? Does it report to the president or an AVP, right? And so under the provost, we can have input directly into curriculum and what's happening on the academic side of things, which I think is where we need to make a significant contribution if we're really going to try to decolonize this space. But one of the things that we have at Laurier that's unlike other universities is we have these institutional documents, right? We have a strategic academic plan and we've got the Laurier strategy. Both of them speak to indigenization. 
Other institutions don't have those in those high level documents. When they're in that high level document, that means uh, a report has to go to the board of governors. Hmm. They have to report directly on what they are doing. They have to show accountability for what they're doing for indigenization hmm. and for EDI efforts here at Laurier, right? So again, we, we found a way to institute the structural power and to use that structural power for transformative change. Mm -hmm. So those of you who might be familiar with Trent University, I have colleagues working at Trent who worked for Trent for years. Trent has been doing uh, uh, the degree in Indigenous Studies since 1970. Mm -hmm. But they're still siloed from the main university. They still have to fight for any recognition within the overall university. Mm -hmm. But at Laurier, we're center and we're mm -hmm. part of the accountability by our leadership. And so that give using that structural power to make change happen, that that's what's key, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of what I did in my initial uh, time in this role was doing a massive environmental scan of the university, who are all the collaborators, who are all the folks that we need to partner with, who are all the things that, you know, that we need to help support this to, to make transformational change happen. And it does not occur in a short time. It's an investment, right? Mm -hmm. But we do that investment with a lot of humility. So in the work that I do for my community, how I was raised in, is we think in generations, right? Mm -hmm. We have a seven generation philosophy. So what are the decisions we're doing today that are going to impact for the next seven generations? Mm -hmm. So the amount of labor, and yes, it's hard. And I know many of you as colleagues on here that I've worked alongside are working just as hard as me to make this a safer place. And I applaud you and I applaud your efforts and, and really celebrate you for the work that you're doing. But let me wish some humility on you because in all reality, our eyes are not going to witness the change that needs to happen, mm. right? But that does not mean we do not wake up tomorrow and put our best effort forward because every day we work at making this place safer and better and more loving and more kind is we're making it easier for those ones that aren't even born yet, right? For our great, great, great grandchildren, they're going to benefit from this work and the labor that we're doing. That's what holds me tight. And that's what holds my dream and my hope in doing this work. Thank you. Alan? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of thank yous um, to Darren and Christine so much. This has been remarkable. Uh, Darren, you started out by talking about the power and importance of story. That, for me, is something I'm going to be hanging on and continuing to think about. Um, and you didn't only give us stories as a theory, but you told us stories and instantiated a, a model of doing decolonizing by uh, telling us stories. And Christine, your talk about identity is what really rang true for me. And I think those two hold together in some fashion, story and identity. Um, we're storied people. I like the way that stories summon us. They call us into relationship. And so um, I think one of the things, these three things I'm gonna take away from this evening, um, uh, decolonization by story, by identity, by relationship. Uh, what a gift it's been. So thank you so much to both of you. And finally, thanks to all of you um, who've joined us tonight for this important conversation. Before you go, I do want to let you know about the next Luther event on February 11th, uh, Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. in Kefir Chapel, Art and Vespers, 
under the theme open to the future. Darren, weren't you just talking to us about the future? <laughs> open to the future collective well-being with the artist Ida Tong, art therapist Ara Parker and the Art Hive Collective and featuring among other musicians, Gerard Jung and Brad Mogach. Please join us and I invite you all to have a wonderful evening. Again, thank you so much. Thank you all. Take care. Bye.